Notice that when the player passes an object or turns in a new direction, whatever he had been looking at before disappears. Where does it go? Take a quick look again, and then we'll talk a lot more about that later. Oh, man. Here we go, people. Minecraft, let's play. Oh, I can't believe I've never done this before. This game is the sweetest game, man. Oh, it is so awesome. Well, I'm so, ex so excited to get started, guys. I hope you're going to enjoy the series as much as I'm going to enjoy playing it. Basically, unless the player is looking at something in the video game, it doesn't exist. It disappears, only to pop back up later if the player looks at it again. This is how quantum physics is telling us that our reality works as well. It means that our reality is not as real as we have always thought it was. Instead, as you hear many quantum physicists say, it pops in and out of existence. So, if matter is not solid and reality is not real, what is this physical universe that we experience and think of as so solid, that looks and feels so real to us? Two models have been developed to answer that question. One is the field, and the other is the holographic universe. We're going to take a close look at both of those models, starting with the field. When we speak of an electron existing as a wave, it isn't like an ocean wave or a radio wave. It is more like a wave of possible locations where the electron could end up as a particle when it is observed. It's a wave of possibilities. This wave of possibilities in which the quantum world exists has been called many names over the years, such as the quantum wave function, which you heard Fred Allen Wolf talk about, the implicate order, which was David Bohm's term, the Planck scale, named after Dr. Max Planck. These scientists apparently like to name things after themselves. The zero-point field, named, of course, for Dr. Zero-point. The superstring field, and the unified field. Mainly, it is just called the field. It is a field of unlimited possibilities out of which everything is created. Lynn McTaggart, author of The Field, defines it as a field of all possibility. In other words, everything you can think of, and everything you can't think of, and everything no one has thought of yet, already exists in wave form in the field. Progress in our understanding of the universe through physics over the past quarter century has been exploring deeper levels of natural law, from the macroscopic to the microscopic, from the molecular to the atomic to the nuclear to subnuclear levels of nature's functioning, so-called electroweak unified scale, grand unified scale, super unified scale. And what we've discovered at the core basis of the universe, the foundation of the universe, is a single universal field of intelligence, a field which unites gravity with electromagnetism, light, with radioactivity, with the nuclear force, so that all the forces of nature and all the so-called particles of nature, quarks, leptons, protons, neutrons, are now understood to be just different ripples on a single ocean of existence. That's called the unified field or superstring field a single universal field of intelligence, an ocean of existence at the basis of everything, mind and matter. And all the so-called particles of the universe, the forces in our universe, everything in the universe are just ripples of, on that ocean of existence. That's the unified field. And that field is, not, is a non-material field. Planets, trees, people, animals, we're all just waves of vibration of this underlying unified superstring field. We're li really living in a thought universe, a conceptual universe. Quantum mechanics is just the play and display of potentiality. So the point I'm making is the deeper you go in the structure of natural law, 
the less material, the less inert, the less dead the universe is, the more alive, the more conscious the universe becomes. Then when you get to the foundation of the universe, the unified field or super strength field, it's simply a field of pure intelligence. Intelligence because it's the fountainhead of all the laws of nature all the fundamental forces, all the fundamental particles, all the laws governing life at every level of the universe have their unified source in the unified field. That makes the unified field the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature. Non-material, dynamic intelligence. Those are the properties of the unified field. So, as you said, the tighter physics have tried to grasp on to physical reality to understand what it's really made of, what are the core building blocks of life, at the basis of it all. Life, the universe, slips through your fingers, and you come up with something that's increasingly abstract, increasingly abstract, to the, come to the realm of pure abstraction. And that's what the unified I I field is. It's pure abstract potential, which rises in waves of vibration to give rise to the particles, the people, everything we see in the vast universe. So, the field is a place outside of space and time where everything, all possibilities, already exists, but only in wave form. This field does not contain particles. It is not matter. It is not part of the physical universe. Instead, it is what the entire universe is made from, from these waves of possibilities. Physicists just given us a name. They call it our quantum wave function because it seems wavy. Um, however, this wave function isn't just a wave of matter like an ocean wave or a sound wave or any kind of wave of matter. It's a wave of possibility. It's a kind of thought wave. And because it is a wave of thought or possibility or not matter, uh, it's invisible to us. But we can't explain what we do see as matter in these small corners of space and time unless we picture that these matter particles somehow come out from or emerge from these thought wave patterns which are invisible to us. Quantum mechanics is really the play and display of information, the play and display of potentiality, waves of information, waves of potential electron. And it's important, the word potential. This isn't the world of electrons. It's the world of potential electrons. But when you have, you have to ask the question, waves of what, really? What is the field that is waving? Is it the ocean? <laughs> no. It's a universal ocean. An ocean of pure potentiality. An ocean of abstract potential existence. We call it the unified field, or super strength field. And that's what we're made of. Fred Allen Wolf said something very important. We can't explain what we do see as matter unless we picture that these matter particles somehow come out from or emerge from these thought wave patterns. The problem is that no one can prove that the field exists. You can't see it. You can't photograph it. You can't measure it. You can't hold it in your hand. But when quantum physicists assume the field is there, they can make incredibly accurate mathematical predictions about the physical universe and how it behaves, which they cannot do without assuming the field is there. Think of it like electricity. You can't see electricity itself. You can only see what electricity produces, the light it makes, and the power and the other effects we count on every day. And when we see those effects, we know that electricity must exist. The same thing is true for the field. Even though we can't prove it exists, nothing makes sense without it in light of the results of the most recent scientific experiments. Think about taking a radio to a tribe in the Amazon who had never seen one before. I can imagine that the natives would stare at that little box for a while, trying to figure out how the music came out of it. They might even tear it apart, 
looking for very little people inside playing very small instruments. But eventually they would deduce that there must be radio waves in the air that they couldn't see and couldn't prove existed, that this little box could receive and translate into sounds they could hear. That's what we're dealing with when it comes to the field. We can't see it, we can't prove it, but we know from looking at the effects that the field must exist. But how did this field come into being? Who made it? Where did it come from? Why is it there? Science has no answers for these questions. They only know that the field must exist. So I will not talk about how the field was created, or who might have created it, or how it already contains all possibilities, because I want to stick only to the science right now in this presentation. We will have to leave that discussion for another time. The next question we can ask, though, is how is reality created from the field? Most quantum physicists agree that it is a very similar process to the creation of a hologram. In other words, the universe we see is a holographic universe. When we look at some of the modern scientific views of reality that have tried to get down, down, down to the nitty-gritty, we see that at its, at its ultimate level, say in M theory or string theory, that reality is not solid, it's mostly empty space, and whatever solidity it has seems more to resemble a hologram picture rather than material, harsh, solid reality. So to understand the holographic universe, we have to understand what a hologram is and how it is created. The simple definition, according to Michael Talbot in the holographic universe, is that a hologram is a virtual image, an image that appears to be where it is not. In other words, a hologram is an image that is not real. The technical definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary is that a hologram is a three-dimensional image reproduced from a two-dimensional pattern of interference produced by a split coherent beam of radiation as a laser. Please don't panic. I'm going to explain that technical definition very simply. Let's look at how a hologram is made. It is actually a two-step process. First, we shoot a laser beam out of a laser gun, and then we immediately split that laser beam into two beams. One of the beams, called the reference beam, makes its way and eventually hits a sensitive holographic plate or film. This is like the film we used to have in our cameras before digital photography. The other half of the laser beam hits an object first, in this case an apple, and then hits the holographic plate. When these two parts of the original laser beam come back together at the holographic plate, they interfere with each other, just like the waves did in our double slit experiment, and they form an interference pattern on the holographic plate. If you look at the holographic plate at this point, you cannot see the apple. All you can see is the interference pattern, which looks like a bunch of waves. This is step one of creating a hologram. Remember those 3D pictures that were such a fad in the 1990s, which looked just like a bunch of meaningless waves? But if you refocused your eyes, an image would pop out for you to see. So for our hologram, we now need a step two to see the image of the apple. In step two, we focus another laser beam on the holographic plate where our apple sits in wave form, and if we get just the right angle, out pops the apple, looking very real and very solid. 
You might wonder what I'm holding in my hands here. Um, looks like a black picture, but if I shine a light on it at a certain angle, watch what happens. Mm -hmm. It's a picture, it's a hologram. Now this isn't one of those cheapskate holograms, this is the real deal. Watch what happens when I turn it. We have genuine three-dimensionality there. Okay? There's no denying that. In fact, one of the things that you know the camera doesn't really pick up is that the image actually comes right out of the picture to the human eye. I mean, if I place my finger here, in terms of my depth perception, that's as if I'm touching its nose, and yet I can move that far back into it. There's nothing there, and yet it appears to be that I could literally actually stroke it. You know, there's no denying that there's a there's real three-dimensionality there. This is a particularly good one because it's got these big gnashers, and if I try to move it a little closer to get you a real good look inside the mouth here, you can see very, very clearly, if you look at the teeth in relation to the tongue behind it, there's genuine movement here. You are actually getting to see behind things. Yeah, so that's the uh, the wonders of the hologram, um, and yet there it is. It's in a completely two dimensional space. It doesn't really exist, even though my eyes tell me that it does exist. I'd like you to see a few examples of just how far we've come in our holographic technology over the past few years and how real holograms that we produce today are beginning to look.